We're doing a series, and I really have loved this series because there's just so much in it that has really, um, really challenged my own heart. And we're going to be we're going to be looking at this this morning. How can I break free from the things that keep me from being what God has made me to be? See, friends. Sin entangles our lives. That's just a reality. Sin entangles our lives. It keeps us from being what God created us to be. It keeps us from experiencing what God wants us to experience. We are our own worst enemy because we do not submit to God or because we don't understand the power of God and we don't yield and seek Him and ask him to bring the change that he wants to bring. And that's why I love this image, because we begin chained, chained to lots of different things. Fear, worry, anxiety, unforgiveness, addictions, guilt and shame, all sorts of different things. The fear of of sin and death and the power that sin and death has in our lives. And the Spirit comes and he begins the process of setting us free as he reveals himself and calls our heart and enables us to profess with faith that he is Lord and Savior. And when we do, the rest of our lives is a process of him transforming us and making us into the image of Jesus. And the more that we allow him to transform us, the more that we allow him to work in us, the more that we become like Christ, the more free that we are. Because we are becoming what God intended when he created us. Now that's a lifelong process, but I can tell you this. I am a lot more free today than I was the moment that I said yes to Jesus in my life. And he has a lot more work to do. Those of you who know me already know that. He has a lot more work to do. But you know what? He who began a good work in me, Philippians 1.6, will continue it until the day of completion. He will never stop working in your life. If you have not experienced that, the problem is not on God's side. The problem is on our human side. We are not letting him do it. And there have been seasons in my life where I have said no to God. I don't want you working in this area because I don't want to change. I like my sin, thank you. I'm comfortable with my life the way it is, thank you. And I don't want to change. But when I say yes to God, he does amazing things in my life. And friends, there's nothing different about me than you. We're all people. We're all broken in the process of being made whole. This morning, what we're going to talk about is breaking free from addictions. Now, let me define addictions for you a little differently. An addiction, as I want to define it this morning, is anything that's a part of your life that you are unwilling to stop doing if God were to ask you. It doesn't mean that it's not something that's good in your life, and it'll make sense in a moment. But anything in your life that you're saying to God, no, 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 I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep living the way I want to live. I'm going to keep doing this. You see, the more that the world has a hand in our lives, the more enslaved we are. And the less free we are. And we're going to see that this morning because God doesn't want anything to own us but him. And I don't want 50% of my heart to belong to him and the other 50 to belong to lots of other things. I want 100% of my heart to belong to him. I want 100% of my life to be yielded to him in obedience. And sometimes God will step into an area and it doesn't... It doesn't meet the definition of of addiction as our world has defined it. But God says to you, I don't want you doing that anymore. Why? Because it's taking over your life in a way where you are becoming enslaved. Emotionally, chemically, physically, in some way, you're becoming enslaved to that thing. Let me give you this picture written by 
a, um, a godly woman in her, in, her, in her blog. Listen to what she said. It's, she, she entitled it, So I Quit Drinking. Listen to what she said. She says this, But I have learned that when you are walking with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is always up to something. It's true. And when it comes to conviction challenging us, I have found the Holy Spirit to be gentle but absolutely relentless. Change and transformation is an ongoing process. We begin to sense that this thing that used to be okay in our lives is no longer okay. The thing that used to mean freedom has now become bondage. She said, a year ago, I knew that God wanted me to stop drinking. I had all the excuses for why I should keep enjoying my wine in the evenings. I work hard. I give so much. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm never hungover. It doesn't affect my life. It's social. It's fun. And it's in the Bible. I began... <laughs> I began to be haunted by the writer of Hebrews who said, let us, let us strip off every weight that hinders and slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with perseverance the race that God has set before us. Now, she said, I began to wonder why I was resisting throwing off this weight of alcohol, why I was so determined to keep running my race with this habit that had begun to feel so heavy. In my soul, I could see the Holy Spirit practically jogging alongside of me to say every now and again, aren't you ready to put that heavy weight down? It looks to me like it's getting heavier the longer you hold on to it. What I finally realized is that it was an invitation to freedom, an invitation to wholeness. It is. It is. Now, I'm not saying having a glass of wine is, is ungodly. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying was for this woman, as the Holy Spirit worked in her heart, what she began to understand was this very simple reality. God was asking her to give it up, and she didn't want to. And she was saying no. In other words... She was addicted to it in the way that I'm defining addiction for us as Christians this morning. What is it in your life that if God came to you today and said, I don't want you doing that anymore, you would say, thanks but no thanks. I'll keep living life my way. Here's what I, I'm going to define, pornog I mean, um, pornography. <laughs> yes, I am in a few minutes, but I'm going to define some different areas of addictions for us, and you'll see this if you look up addictions. Here are just some of them. Drugs, prescription drugs, op uh, opioids, you guys know all about those. Gambling, food, we need food, but it can become an addiction. When we look to food to bring comfort, have you ever heard of comfort food? It's what we eat in the Midwest. It's all we eat in the Midwest. It's, it's, and, and then I stopped looking to Jesus. Do you see it? Do you see it? I begin to look at other things to meet this need that Christ wants to meet in my life. Sex, pornography, listen to this. It, boy, this is, this is really frightening. Listen to this. Since 1915, the industry, pornography industry, has grown a hundred times. In America today, we spend $97 billion a year on pornography. It's more, they receive more in pornography in one year than the NBA, the NFL, and Major League Baseball receives in a year. Friends, this is a serious problem in the American culture today. It's become more and more serious because of the internet. And parents, you better understand the power of the internet and you better be choosing and making decisions to help your children to fight this but here's some more computers the internet cell phones the average person touches their cell phone you ready for this 2,617 times a day that's not me <laughs> playing video games exercising what do you mean exercising is good 
It is good. But if exercise has become an addiction where I can't live without exercising, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Shopping. Nah, nobody has that problem. Um, <laughs> cutting. Cutting. Now, some of you who are in an older generation may not understand what that is. But a lot of parents and kids know what it is. They see it all the time now. And it becomes addictive. I'm going to share, share more about that next week. Caffeine. Oh, now we're getting personal. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with caffeine. Until my body's addicted to it, until I can't say no to it, then it's a problem. Anger, work, perfectionism, acceptance, hoarding, codependency, sugar, guilty. I thought I was getting away with something um, here at Cross Point because uh, the, the children's team had this big bag of M&Ms. I love M&Ms. Um, some friends from Michigan last week who were visiting gave me a big package of, remember seeing them? Peanut butter M&Ms, they were gone in two days. Where is that, that mouse? I don't know where. <laughs> what I didn't know was that, realize is that they had a camera for the hallway. And I'm sneaking into the children's room and our receptionist is watching me the entire time. I'm thinking I'm getting away with this thing. Here I am preaching on this this morning, and uh, Sarah Chan, one of our children's directors, caught me in her office looking for M&Ms. In my last church, I had to bring my little corgi shih tzu and hold her up to the cabinets until she would sniff out the, where they were hiding the candy from me. Friends, I know that this is not a simple topic, and I don't mean to treat it simply this morning because we only have 35, 40 minutes total. Here's my, here's my encouragement to you today, is just to identify it and to start taking steps against it. I know where I struggle. I love sugar, and my body's been craving sugar more and more and more because I've been giving into that more and more and more. And I think I need it. When really what I need is Jesus. And I'm going to talk about that this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Romans. And we're going to look at Paul's struggle. And I want to draw from this just some, some different truths that we can apply to the, I'm not saying that he was talking about addictions here, but the principles apply. Beginning in verse 14, we know that the law, speaking of the law of God, is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but I do what I hate to do. Doesn't that sound familiar? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, because it convicts me. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing." Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Will you pray with me? Father, give us truth as we struggle with this this morning. 
And I would pray for any who are here today for whom these are just really hard words. Lord, and I ask that you would help them to see that you have a better plan for their life. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As I begin, I want to mention that there's a lot of help for any of us who struggle with any kind of addiction. There's counseling, there's accountability, and I'll mention that this morning. There's also a wonderful ministry that we have here every Friday night called Celebrate Recovery. And I've been there a few times to see what they're doing, and I love it. It's an amazing ministry. It's not just for people who struggle with drugs. It's not just for people who struggle with alcohol. It's for anybody who has any kind of a struggle. And it's an amazing place using the 12-step the program that, um, that is biblical when it's run through a church like ours and we run through Celebrate Recovery. It's biblical. In fact, Celebrate Cover Recovery not just the 12 step, but the 12 step through Celebrate Recovery is the most successful anti addiction program in the world. And we have it right here every Friday night at Cross Point. And I would encourage you to call the church office if you want more information about that. But here's what I want you to see this morning How do addictions interfere with our life and our faith? Well, number one, you know, you talk about, gosh, I just. Have a couple of drinks, Lord, as this woman was saying. But it wasn't about that. It was about the fact that she was becoming, um, this was becoming something that she needed in order to feel okay. And, and it draws us away from Christ. The, our God said that we are to love him as the first priority of our life. If there's anything in my life that I'm unwilling to surrender to God, that one thing has become an idol that I am worshiping. It could be my marriage. It could be my children. It could be anything. Anything that I am unwilling to surrender to God in my life is a problem. It's an idol. It's something that I am loving more than I'm loving God. Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Second reason that we should, that this becomes a problem, addictions become a problem in our life, is that they keep us from being good stewards of what God has provided. There, many addictions can have a harmful effect on our bodies. Now, there were some good things that I, that I put in that list. Yeah, I mean, exercise is a good thing until exercise becomes an addiction. Something my whole self-esteem falls apart if I don't do on a day. God does not want us to live like that. That's not free. That's not free. I have a friend in Michigan. I love him dearly. But he has an addictive personality. Everything he does, he does full board. He got into exercise he got into running, and he lost all of his toenails because he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and he ran. He doesn't do anything part way. And there are things that we do to our bodies that aren't healthy. Too much alcohol is not good for your body. Drugs, um, drugs that are, we're not supposed to be taking or uh, overdoing prescription drugs are not good for our bodies. And we, our body is the temple of God, and we are to be good stewards of what God has provided. What I, um, some of you are going to be surprised, I was actually a little bit heavier at one point than I am now. I have gained somewhere between 12 and 15 pounds since I've been with you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no, it's just all the transition. It started about six months before I moved here. But I had lost 28 pounds on something called the Daniel Plan, not the Daniel Diet. I, I couldn't do that. But the Daniel Plan, and, um, and we'll teach that class here at some point. But I just cut out sugars. And you know what? My body began to respond. I, my energy level shot through the roof, which was a little scary for everybody around me. But it just shot through the roof. What was I doing? I was treating my body as God created my body to be treated. And I was honoring it. It's not that I want to live forever in this world, but for the years that God gives me in this world, I want to be a good steward of my body so I have the strength and the energy 
to do what it is that he wants me to do. Does that make sense? And also, being a good steward of my finances. Some of these addictions can start to cost a lot of money. And that's a terrible problem. That's a terrible problem. It means that we can't be as generous. So these are things that get in the way of our life. A third area is that addictions, by their very nature, we begin to focus on me and what I want to do. And I'm less sensitive to the people around me. And we read in Philippians chapter 2 that we're to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others above ourselves. Not only looking to our interests, but to their interests as well. When you're addicted, you're not looking to the interests of others. You're looking to fulfill that addiction. So here are just three quick reasons why it's a problem. Now let me share with you some things that we can do to break free. Again, this is not meant to be comprehensive. It's not to be meant, it's not meant to be all inclusive of all the things. We're not doing a series on addictions, but I want to give you a taste of, of how you can get free. And if the only thing you do coming out of this is to say, okay, I need some accountability, or I need to start going to celebrate recovery, or I need to, you fill in the blank, then this has been well worth it. So, first thing, very similar to actually the first of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Admit to yourself, admit to God and to others that you are powerless to control your tendency to do the wrong thing, but however that wrong thing is defined by God in your life, not just by others, but by God in your life, and that your life is unmanageable apart from him. Paul says, I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner, a prisoner of the sin, of the addiction, of the struggle. Friends, I don't want to be a prisoner of anything but Jesus Christ. I don't want to be a prisoner to anything. I want to be fully present and fully available and fully able to serve my Lord and my Savior. I don't want to be chained. I want to be free. But you know what? It is amazing how I have the, the capacity to justify, to defend, and to excuse my sin. I am an expert at it. Most of us are. Most of us, if we've lived life for any length of time, we know people who are struggling with drug or alcohol addictions. And one of the things that always amazes me is that they deny it. Everybody else in the world sees it. But often they deny it. Or if they don't deny it, they tell you that it's under control. Some of you here this morning, the Holy Spirit may be convicting you right now. Go before the Lord, all of us, and ask him, is there an area, Lord, that you want me to let go of in my life? Because it's, it's gotten hold of me. It's, I'm, I've become a slave to it. And we don't want to live like that. And so... The Apostle Paul was so honest, he admits, hey, there are things in my life that I don't want to be doing, and yet I keep doing it. Yes, we are sinful people, but God can set us free, and addictions are powerful. They often have physiological or psychological roots in us, and they're very, very, very hard to break. I know that. And so what we do is we look for the help that we need to get well. We stop, we start playing the game of excuses and we say to God, we say to ourselves, and we say to a select few others, this is a problem in my life. Will you tell me the truth? Will you hold me accountable? Will you challenge me? Will you pray for me and with me? I want to be free. I want to be free. 
Many of you have heard of Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley, one of my favorite pastors. I love, gosh, I love almost everything he says. I, I love listening to his podcasts. He's amazing. But I want you to hear his story. He said, ever since my high school buddy and I drank ourselves sick with, with a case of quartz, I have loved beer. Out of the keg, out of the tap, bottle, frosty mug, it doesn't matter. I just like it. But I know that alcoholism haunts my family ancestry. I have early memories of following my father through the halls of a rehab center to see his sister. Similar scenes repeated themselves with other re relatives for decades. Beer doesn't mix, mix well with my family DNA. So at the age of 21, I decided before God I would not do it anymore. Now again, he's not saying that it's evil. He's not saying that it's, that it's sinful for everybody. But for him, he understood the risk. I kept my preference to myself. No beer at home, lest my daughters think less of me. No beer in public, who knows what, who might see me. None at home, none in public leaves only one option. Convenience, store, parking lots. For about a week, I was that guy in the car, drinking out of the brown paper bag. I don't know what resurrected my cravings, but I do remember what stunted them. En route to speak at a men's retreat, I stopped for my daily purchase. I walked out of the convenience store with a beer pressed against my side, scurried to my car for fear of being seen, opened the door, climbed in, and opened the can. Then it dawned on me. I had become the very thing that I, that I preach against. A hypocrite. A pretender. Two-faced. Acting one way, or uh, claiming one thing, living another. I had written sermons about people like me. Christians who care more about appearance than integrity. It wasn't the beer, but the cover-up that nauseated me. So here's what he did. He confessed it, first to God, then to his family, and then to the leaders of his church. He eventually confessed it to the church family. Now, why did he do that? He did it because he knew that if he brought it out of the darkness into the light, there would be help. That's right. That's right. And the things that we hide are the very things that we know aren't right. And we've got to stop playing games with ourselves and stop playing games with one another and stop playing games with God. It's time for us to be real, to acknowledge our brokenness. There isn't a person in here who isn't broken. If you're afraid that somebody might see that you're broken, friends, we already know we are. We all have issues that we struggle with. What I always say to friends of mine who struggle with addictions, it's okay to have an addiction, it's just not okay to do nothing about it. Addictions are just a reality of our human brokenness. But to refuse to do anything about it isn't right. To justify and defend it isn't right. Here's the next thing I want you to see. Believe and trust that you matter to God and that he has the power to set you free. How big is your God? What I have found is when I make the decision, no more. I'm done with this. God, I give it to you. I surrender it to you. And sometimes, depending on how deep it is in me, I have to do that over and over and over again. I know that I have an issue with sugar right now. I know that. I know I have an issue with my eating right now. I know that. It's gotten hold of me. Now, you might not think that's a big deal. It is to me. And it's not about my weight. It's about surrendering everything to God and living the way that he wants me to live. It's about having more energy for the things that he asks me to do. It's about my body being as healthy as it can be for as long as God gives me life so that I can do the things that God has asked me to do. And so here's what it says, what a wretched man I am, Paul says. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death, to this sinful 
struggle. Here's what he says. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Now that is a word in, in the present tense, but continue, it's a continuing tense. So it's now and forevermore. Who is delivering and will continue to l- deliver me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I want to ask you, whatever it is, is your, which is your struggle today, I want to ask you this. Do you believe that God has the power to set you free? Do you believe that God can go into that area of your life and he can change you? I believe it. If we are willing to surrender it, I believe it. I want to tell you about my friend Steve. I almost gave you his last name. He's sitting right here. No, I'm teasing you. Um, <laughs> um, and, and my friend uh, from a couple of churches ago, I love this brother, and he, this is something he shared from the pulpit, so I'm not sharing anything out of, out of school. So if you share something with me, don't worry that 30 years from now, I'm not going to be sharing it with, with a group of people. But um, Steve is totally fine with me sharing this. Steve was an alcoholic, and he worked in a restaurant that had a bar, not a good place for him to be. And he was at the point where his wife said, I'm leaving you, I'm taking the kids. Finally, he said, I've got a problem. And he broke down, and on his knees, he just wept before God. He said, God, take this away. God took it away like that. He has never had a desire for alcohol since that day. Now, he thought that was easy. God, take away my desire for uh, for tobacco. God didn't. Why? Because God said to him, you're going to go through a process now. Because addiction is an issue of your personality, and we're going to go through a process together. And he began a process of meeting with people, of doing different things to help him to get free from the addiction he had to tobacco. And last time I talked with him, he was experiencing greater and greater and greater freedom in that area of his life. But it was a process God decided to take him through. Sometimes God says, right now, sometimes God says, no, because the process is going to do more for you than me just healing you instantly. And, some, and for some of us, that's what God does. God has the power. I believe it. Here's the third thing I want you to see. Whoops. Oh, I'm going all over the place. Oh, here we go. Consistently and daily choose to commit all of your life and all of your will to Christ. God, I'm going to surrender every day. Some of the first words out of your mouth should be, God, I'm going to surrender this day to you. It's yours. Do what you want to do in me and through me. God, if there's something I'm doing in my life today and it's not what you want for me, convict me. God, when I face that temptation, and I'll preach a sermon on temptation at some point, but when I face that temptation, Lord, would you just set me free? God, give me the strength in that moment. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves that old sinful nature, take up their cross daily. The cross represents dying to myself for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of Christ, and follow him. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for Jesus, what? Saves it. That's when I'm fully human. That's when I'm everything God made me to be. That's when I'm most free. Not when I have all these things the world says I need, but when I am what God intended me to be. And so I seek to lay my life before him. And then finally, Practice the discipline of saying no to your desires. I remember the story of reading a story of a guy that was really struggling with with an alcohol addiction. And and he said, yeah, I I had to, uh, for every day I was, I just made sure I was going to work and coming home from work along a route that didn't have a bar. And, And then he said, and then this day I just, I just couldn't fight it anymore. And he said, I drove around that bar four times before I stopped to get a drink. And that's, we don't have a plan. We don't, we're not making a decision to say no. Listen to what it says. 
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I have a plan. I have a purpose. And he says that is to discipline myself to live as God intended me to live. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. He said, no, I strike a blow to my body. That strike a blow to my body, it literally means I give myself a black eye. Now, he's not saying that. He's just using a picture. What he's saying is we need to discipline ourselves. We need to learn to say no to things. And I make my body a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. What is he saying? He's saying that I work to discipline myself in my life. Let me close by suggesting a few practical things that you can, you can do. Begin fasting. Maybe a, a meal, maybe a day, maybe a couple of days. Each week or each month. You need to learn, and I need to learn, how to say no to the cravings that are natural to my life. And what I found, when I fast from food, I begin to be able to say no to other things. Because I'm practicing the discipline of saying no to my human urges. And as I fast from certain things, I begin to get more free in other areas of my life as well. The point of fasting isn't to lose weight. The point of fasting is to surrender more of my life to Jesus Christ. And so when I'm fasting, I'm recognizing the urges that I have to eat, the hunger pangs, and then I'm reminded all of this belongs to God. And I am going to focus on the Lord and give my, more of myself to him. There are lots of things that you can fast from. Sugar and caffeine. Um, when we were doing this Daniel plan, we didn't eat sugar for, processed sugar for what, six months? And I, I was eating a lot of food. I lost 28 pounds. I just began saying no to these, these things that God never intended for my body. At least in the, in the volume that I was putting it in my body. Um, fast from television. Fast from sports. Fast from video games or the computer unless you're a student, fasting from your cell phone for a day. <laughs> Enough said. Find ways. Invite people to hold you accountable. You don't have to spread it to everybody, but one or two people you say, hey, would you call me? Would you call me and ask me how I'm doing in this area? That's scary, isn't it? Because now if you fail, here's the thing, it's okay to fail. It's just not okay to give up. Did you hear that? It's okay to fail. It's not okay to give up. I don't care if you failed a thousand times. Today is a new day. Start again. Amen. Start fresh. And rededicate and recommit. If you struggle with pornography on the computer, there are things that you can, filters that you can download that enable somebody else to receive a printout of any questionable sites you've been on on that computer over the last month. Parents, know that that exists. I've had many men over the years ask me to be their account accountability partner in that area, and I would get weekly print out, or on my computer, any sites that they visited that were questionable. Just knowing that I was seeing what they were on helped them to stand against it. It's accountability. It's friendship. It's what we should be doing for one another. If you are with friends who are encouraging you to live a lifestyle that you shouldn't be living, and particularly I would say this to young people, if you, your group around you is encouraging you to do things you shouldn't be doing more than you are encouraging them to do the things they should be doing, then it's time to step away from those relationships for a season until you are stronger and to build friendships with people who will help you and enable you to be stronger. 
If you struggle with a shopping addiction, maybe you need to go shopping with a friend who will say, I don't think you need that. Or, or put filters on your computer so there are certain sites you can't visit anymore. We have to take steps. We have to learn to say no. We have to fight against it. And God, in this process, I'm, I'll promise you this. I grew spiritually in amazing ways when I said no to sugar and M&Ms. Now I'm off the wagon again. <laughs> but I felt convicted this week as I was preparing this sermon because I felt the Spirit saying to me, this is a problem again. And we need to deal with it. I think I could have a very addictive personality. I'm just, I'm, I have that kind of personality. I have to be careful. I'll close with this. Beth and I both come from alcoholic homes. And we decided when we got married that we would never have alcohol in our home while our children were growing up. The reason for that, the reason for that wasn't to be holy or impressive. We never even knew our kids knew. But I didn't want, want to model for them something that I was afraid of. Because these things can go generation to generation. And we wanted to stop it at our generation. Now I will tell you, that one time when Katie was about six years old, I don't know, you and I were the only ones home, I did a wedding uh, rehearsal. And after the wedding rehearsal, we were having dinner, and it was outside, and um, I looked in this case, and there was all under ice. It was about 100 degrees. It was so hot. It was an outdoor wedding. And there was something called Mike's Hard Lemonade. And I love lemonade. <laughs> and I thought, I thought it just meant it was really strong lemonade. <laughs> and I'm drinking this, and people are like. And um, they said, you know that's alcohol, right? Because they knew my story and that we had made this commitment. Oops. So I tossed Katie the keys and she drove us home. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you for who you are. Lord, I know that I'm stepping on toes this morning. I know that I'm making people uncomfortable this morning. And I'm glad because I love them too much to not tell them the truth. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you have spoken into my life this week. I thank you for the ways that you've challenged me this week. I thank you, Lord, for the ways that you're going to transform lives because people are going to take it seriously. I pray for any here today who know right now there's an area that they're addicted to. And Jesus Christ, I pray your power into their life. I pray for healing. I pray for wholeness. I pray for restoration. I pray for freedom. May that no longer have power over their life. May it now be surrendered to Jesus Christ. For the sake of his glory. For the sake of their life. For the sake of the next generation. Help us to be courageous. Help us to be bold. In Jesus' name we pray.